Yeah, yeah g'day, I'm James Houston. We've got 4,000 hectares here in, uh, in the Upper Murray. We run a breeding herd of 2,000 cows, supplemented with a small flock of sheep. Um, the back end of the drought, like a lot of other people in the industry, we needed to do things differently. They were tough times and a climate that was changing. And at the breaking of the drought, the, one of the first things that we noticed was the resilience of the native grasses. And we started looking into native grasses and how to manage them. We've fenced halfway up the slope. They can see along the, the track. And in doing so, we've, it's enabled us to push the, the herd up into the, the higher parts of the, of the paddocks and encourage them to graze those areas that otherwise they hadn't. What we've done on top, along the ridge line, we've divided the southern face from the northern face. And that's enabled us to push the cattle over the top into the southern areas where previously the cattle wouldn't go. The, the grasses there weren't as sweet and we're getting um, overgrown by fog grasses and other grasses that weren't high in productivity. Grazing those in a rotation basis is enabling us to bring back weeping grass, otherwise known as microlina, which are high performance native grasses. That's where we're getting the, the improvements in what we're doing here. We've found that we've been able to wean the, the calves that are higher weight and which has enabled them to be moved onto the river flats, onto the improved pastures and legumes and where that they can um, get fatter quicker and off to market sooner which for us as a business meant that improved productivity but we're also reducing our methane on the property and reducing our greenhouse gas emissions and for us the increases have been remarkable in terms of carrying capacity and weight gain in the weaners. There's been a lot of information about carbon farming and we've developed concepts to put that theory into practice. Um, with government changing, policies changing and we're finding that difficult to act upon the changes that we're wanting to implement. Behind me you can see a landscape that's been allowed to naturally regenerate. It's marginal country, it's hard to manage, it's costly to manage. What are the financial implications of us engaging in the CFI? Do we exclude stock? Do we mix species environmentally planted out? Do we receive carbon credits for allowing it to regenerate? We're wanting to act on these things. Until we've got some simplicity and clarity and policy, we don't know what avenue we should be taking. We've developed a strong network with various government departments and government agencies. And it's out of that network of people we got approached by MLA to become a part of Farm 300. And I see it as a as another tool for us to progress what it is that we're doing, um, to share what it is that we're doing, to learn from other people what they're doing, um, to keep our finger on the pulse about government policy, to um, keep the finger on the pulse about what incentives are available to make these changes. We need to be at the forefront of the discussion to enable us to keep in the game. The three components of the program are to firstly make sure that all the latest R&D is available to producers and advisors through our website but also other publications. Secondly, there's a um, program where we're looking to make sure we upskill all as many service providers as we can and taking around 25 of those advisors to then work with 300 producers across the country um, through a process that will develop a, a plan specific to their business that will then subsequently improve their productivity but also mitigate greenhouse gas emissions.